Good afternoon, members, officers, and everyone watching the webcast of this meeting. My name is Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, and I would like to welcome you to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee, of which I am the chair. I can confirm that the meeting is quorate, there being at least five committee members present here in the chamber. Following the end of the temporary legislation allowing public meetings to be held entirely by video conference, all voting members must now be in the same room. However, officers and other councillors will be joining the meeting online, so it is clear to members of the public a committee member proposing or seconding a motion or voting must be in the room. Public speakers and others, such as those giving evidence to the committee, may be present in the chamber, addressing the meeting by video conference or by watching the webcast. But please be patient as we le learn to use the new technology. When we move to a vote on any item and there is not clear affirmation, members will vote electronically and I will announce the numbers for, against and abstaining. Names will be recorded in the published decisions and minutes of the meeting. Finally, some housekeeping rules. We still need to follow the government's advice on indoor gatherings and social distancing due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So, please always wear a face mask covering when in the building and in the chamber, except when sitting at your table. Minimise the risk both to you and to others. Make use of the hand sanitizer on the table in front of you and at the sanitizing station on the way in. And please make sure you anti-back your table and chair, both now and before you go home. Please observe the one-way system in place into, out of, and around the chamber. Enter the chamber door as you've done. I don't think you need to worry about that. But if you do leave, need to leave, um, there is one exception to the one-way markers, and that is in the event of a fire alarm sounding. In that case, please leave the chamber by the nearest exit and use the stairs to the ground floor and through to the fire room. Do not use the lift in the event of a fire evacuation. This meeting is being webcast live, and a recording will be available after the meeting. By being present or contributing to the meeting, Participants agree to their images and voices being broadcast and used for training purposes. Attendees may also make their own video and audio and video recordings so long as they do not interfere with the meeting. And could I ask you please to turn off your mobile phones or set them to silent? May I just remind members Thank you very much indeed. Okay. May, may I ask whether any member wishes to declare an interest in any part of today's agenda, please? Uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 20th of April 2021 have been circulated. They are shown on pages one to four of your agenda pack. Um, 
may I ask that they be approved and I will sign them in due course as a true record. Is anyone against? Thank you very much indeed. Item five is public questions and I believe that we have no questions from the public. Could there be no questions? Question. No questions, Chair. Thank you very much indeed. And therefore we move directly on to the private sector housing, poli housing policy, which is documented in pages five to 72 of your agenda pack. And I will invite Councillor Brian Mills, the Um, good evening to the committee and other officers. Um, this is a, a policy document that has been created to uh, fill an absence and um, it's been uh, developed by uh, Leslie Beavers who is with us uh, today and um, I can commend it to the committee as a um, piece of work that will um, articulate our policy in this area so that anybody in the private housing sector will know what to expect from us uh, at any stage in terms of uh, the quality of provision. So um, I mean, there's a lot of detail in here. Um, it's been well worked through. I've revised it with, um, in, in small part with, uh, with Leslie. So I'm happy to uh, commend it to the committee and answer any questions between me and Leslie uh, by the committee. Thank you very much. I, I am aware that there are a number of questions for you. So I do not believe that Councillor Chung Johnson is with us remotely. So I will go first of all to members of the committee. So who would like to fetch? Councillor Gormsley. Thank you. Um, could you explain, uh, please, why this is coming from environmental health and not housing? Uh, yes, I can. So this is um, uh, an enforcement and licensing issue uh, because it deals with uh, environmental health uh, as, as an issue, as a core subject, and therefore it falls within the remit of the Environmental Health Service. Sorry, just, no, thank you. Just a few questions arising. Um, uh, I think that for this, I mean, this is a worthy document. I mean, as you say, it does fill a gap. Uh, I think we need to be careful. Um, sometimes the tenants are just as much fault as a, as a landlord. There are various cases in my village I've dealt with over the years where um, uh, the tenants fail to keep the property in its satisfactory condition and then tries to blame the, the landlord. So all I'm saying uh, is we do have to be careful, and I think that's spelled out in the documents, and every case is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so I think we do need to make sure that if there is actually an issue concerning the property and how it's been maintained, whether there is health and safety issues to be made, actually who is responsible, whether there's a tenant's the landlord's neglect or whether the tenant, I mean, there's one case in my village where um, there was someone who had two goulash dogs and kept the landlord in total fear of him um, and the dog savaged the property, um, uh, and he tried to then blame the, the landlord. So there are issues there, I think, balance between tenant and, and, and landlord. Um, the other question is, um, do we actually have the staff resources necessary for this? Because these could be quite time consuming, these cases, looking at them and investigating them, taking them through discussion, often they're controversial. Do we, are we intending to, do it from existing staff resources, or, or are we going to actually employ additional people to do it? Um, what else? 
We will talk about licenses now, and it may, perhaps it's mentioned in the report, I've, I might have missed it. Um, uh, I'd just be interested to know exactly under what circumstances you do have to have a license, what are, what are the requirements, do all landlords have to have license, or some or whatever. Um, so, so I think that, oh, sorry, have you, have you concluded your questions? No, the, the other one, the fourth one is, we're talking here about fines and penalties, what actually happens to the money? Is it actually, because uh, the fines can be quite substantial, do we keep it or is it paid over to central government or, or whatever? Anyway, just a number of questions and observations. Thank you. So I'll let um, uh, Leslie answer uh, the last questions because they're of a sort of technical nature and she's much more aware of uh, this legislation. In terms of the balance between uh, tenant and landlord, I think um, I can uh, answer that from at least the perspective of being both, having been a tenant of an absolutely dreadfully neglected property and of uh, being a landlord of a uh, property that was neglected by the tenant. Um, so uh, I think this strikes a perfectly reasonable balance in terms of um, really trying to uh, address the issue of poor landlords who let their property uh, into an inappropriate state and offers uh, their tenants some protection uh, from such neglect. Um, I think uh, clearly we'll have to uh, monitor this as we uh, go on to make sure that that balance is re retained. And also uh, in considering this uh, cabinet, uh, we've had useful contributions from Toomey Hawkins, who is, a, uh, is also a landlord, in terms of keeping in touch with uh, the landlord community uh, to make sure that they understand that we're uh, trying to be supportive to good landlords in this respect um, versus the poor landlords who uh, need um, persuading to act properly, if I could put it that way. Thank you. Leslie. Uh, with regard to the staff resources question that you asked, the service has recently gone through a restructure and we, sh we should be able to um, implement this policy within the new resources that we've got within the team. Um, for licences, not all private landlords need licences. Um, the only area that does need a licence is for the houses of multiple occupation. And for those, it's if there's um, five or more people in the property forming two or more households. So they're the only ones who have got who need licensing within South um, with regard to fines and penalties, it isn't something that I envisage that we will use very often, um, but it gives us an alternative to prosecution, which can be a very lengthy process to go through. For the fine, fines and penalties, it is all within the document how we determine what penalty um, somebody should, should pay. If we do go down that route, the penalty is kept within, within our service area. I think that covers everything that was asked. Thank you very much indeed. Chair, <coughs> Councillor Anna Badman, followed by Councillor Graham Cohen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, right, uh, just on page 22, just a pernickety little thing, um, very top line, whole, it's referring to banning orders and it's talking about the subject of the order cannot, blah, blah, blah. Hold a license that should be a C, uh, not an S. Uh, license spelt that way is the verb, whereas the subject is spelt with a C. Um, I also wanted to ask, <laughs> how does this, rep it sounds like a, quite a significant step up in enforcement work, and I wondered whether that's going to require more resources, but Ms Beavers has explained that it should be able to be managed within the resources that we have available. Um, and similarly, um, Councillor Cathcart answered a similar, asked a similar question to myself, but I'm posing mine slightly differently, and mine is this clearly is intended to protect tenants from uh, negligent landlords. Um, but I wanted to know, are there equal and proper protections for landlords? Because we know there are good and bad landlords and also good and bad tenants. 
So are there equal and proper protections for landlords? Um, also, I wanted to understand how does this interplay with subletting, uh, inappropriate subletting, and use of properties that are rented for one purpose being then re-rented out for Airbnb. Um, so I wondered if those could be addressed, please. Thank you. Councillor Mills. Yes, I, I, um, uh, clearly this is not uh, intended to um, actually work in terms of the protection uh, of uh, landlords from negligent tenants. Um, the uh, tenant uh, deposit scheme, for example, uh, would uh, address that. But uh, um, I think I'll let uh, Leslie, if she's got anything to add to add to that, because I'm I'm now stretching um, my understanding of where where we're at in the limitations. Clearly, this is uh, trying to protect tenants from negligent uh, landlords and offers us as a, an enforcement authority the ability to issue fixed pen penalty notices rather than to go through a formal prosecution uh, process. So this is similar in, in many ways to where we can act elsewhere, fly tipping, for example, uh, where we've got the same, same option and it's a much less expensive process to go through. Leslie, I don't know if you want to uh, try and answer uh, Councillor Bradman's other questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with um, Councillor Mills. This, this policy is with regard to protecting tenants from rogue landlords. Um, as, as we're all aware, most landlords are good, most tenants are good, um, but there is that element of, of landlords who don't do the actions that you, they should to protect the tenants, and that is where this policy comes in. Unfortunately, it isn't for protecting landlords from bad tenants. Landlords have got um, actions that they can go through themselves to limit the, that that happening, um, and ultimately they can go through the courts if the tenants do need if they are causing problems for them. Um, with regard to how to interplay with subletting, this policy doesn't cover the subletting of of a property on. Um, so I, no, I'm, that's it really. It just doesn't cover that part of Councillor Bradman's question. Thank you. Did you wish to come back, Councillor Bradman? Thank you, Chairman. Yes. Uh, as I said, I acknowledged that at the outset. Uh, but what I, my question was, are there equal and proper protections for landlords? And if there are, then great. <laughs> so, so I was hoping somebody would tell me what they were. That's all. Thank you. So I think, I think Leslie's answered your question there. That this this doesn't cover that, and there are some protections uh, I know from uh, de particularly deposit schemes in in uh, that respect. But this is that's uh, out of scope for this document or these documents. Thank you. Um, we have Councillor um, Sue Hunt on Zoom that would like to speak, and then. Uh, could be the prioritising those not in the room, and then yeah. Councillor Cohn yeah. and Councillor Richard Willing. Can we invite Councillor Steve Hunt, who's joining us remotely, who wishes to ask Thank a you. question? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'd like to apologise first for A, only being able to join remotely today, and B, even then only being a few minutes late. So sorry about that. Um, uh, I, and therefore, this question may have already arisen. I apologise if it has, but. It's about the uh, section, I think, on page 11 in the introduction, where it talks about the powers being tenure blind. Um, and so it can be used in connection with owner occupied homes. Um, but I found it fairly difficult to see. I mean, most of it is understandably written in terms of protecting, as, as just mentioned, tenants from landlords. Um, I just wondered how much of it would in practice apply to cases, for example, and I know, um, Leslie, you'll be aware of the case in Impington, which we've discussed recently, where there is a house in a, a very poor state of repair, um, where it's been difficult to get the uh, the owner to uh, to do anything about it, and the nuisance is not nuisance or risk is not to the tenant, as this is mostly phrased as um, in this document, but is to the neighbours and and the public at large. I wonder whether you could comment, and also on whether any of the 
um, sort of remedies and, and legal powers in the appendix um, are applicable in that case. I think I'll leave that to you to, to answer, Leslie, if I may. Um. <laughs> with, with regard to the owner-occupier, the, the time when I have used Housing Act legislation in the past is when the owner-occupier needs some grant work or something like that, and if we can show that the property is in a, in a poor state of repair, that might help them with that, that avenue of it. With regards to the empty properties, some of the legislation listed at, at the back of this policy is relevant to empty properties. Um, this policy itself doesn't cover empty properties, but some of the housing acts can be used for for um, for that purpose. Councillor Hunt, did you wish to come back? Yes, thank you for that explanation. Is there anywhere a, 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 a sort of a a guide to what is and isn't. Is it written down somewhere? Which bits of that legislation can be and can't be? Well, with regard to entry properties. Yeah, yeah, in particular. I can get you a list of that outside of this this forum if you would like. Okay, okay, thank you. I just wondered if it ought to be somehow in, in, included in this, as, as it is a, you know, it says it's ten year blind. But I felt that as reading this with a with a sort of owner occupiers, you know mindset i didn't see that much to help me understand what we can and can't do for owner occupier cases i'm personally not sure whether this policy is the best place for that because we have got an empty home strategy which might which i think will may well feed into that more than this policy okay perhaps yeah yeah okay thank you i know, th I know there's been some uh, discussion previously about empty dwelling management orders and, and what case they they have uh, but it's a very uh, underused um, uh, policy. Mm. I think when I, I looked in the first three or four years of it being used, only 43 were issued nationally. Uh, so um, there is a, uh, a whole other area uh, that is considering that. Uh, the yes. whole, those, and I was wondering if there's, a, if there's a gap there between that, which I think is mainly about trying to get them back into use, and, and this, which is about things being a hazard in some sense. and, and you know, there's this case where over-occupier houses can be a hazard to, to various people. And I just wonder whether that ought to be more specific in this document or not. Perhaps I could ask oh. Councillor Hunt if you and Councillor Milnes would agree we would take this offline since it's clearly not covered by this policy. OK. Thank you very much. Councillor Cohn. Thanks very much, Chairman. I think a lot of what I was going to ask has already been um, answered by uh, Councillor Milnes. I, I agree with Councillor Milnes that you know part of this policy is about evening up the, the, the balance, and I think he, he put that across well. There are, um, you know, uh, legal actions that landlords can take, and I, I think this just sort of, you know, moves towards a, a fairer balance. I think. For me, the resources are important and making sure we've got the, the right skill mix and the right um, you know, resources in place. Obviously, this document only works if those resources and those staffing teams are in place to you know, carry out those um, checks and do that in, in enforcement, protecting sort of vulnerable residents, essentially. So I think that actually isn't something we, we, we should try and do. It's something we must do if we want to enforce this this document. The, the other question I had for um, Councillor Milnes was just around sort of big landlords. So landlords that, you know, in many of our villages, we've got, uh, you know, very big providers of um, uh, social rental or, um, you know, large landlords that own a lot of houses. Um, and I just wondered if there could be anything in this policy about working a little bit sort of more closely with those big landlords to address some it, some of those issues because I know that you know many of our, our tenants come to us from those big providers um, and you know part of that is about communication and part of that is you know them not sort of fulfilling their their role as well as they, they could be and I just wondered how this policy would get across to those those bigger landlords thanks very much I'm not really sure that there's a, a necessity for differentiating between the size of landlords. Um, there's a, an escalation process here. 
um, that um, monitors what landlords are doing and whether or not um, uh, have, they effectively have repeat um, offences. Uh, in other words, whether they are... Uh, so, for example, in the case of a large landlord, uh, if they are persistently poor operators, that will become evident uh, by complaints uh, from their tenants. Um, so I think the uh, the policy covers that certainly in the uh, in terms of escalation to larger tenants, uh, sorry, larger land landlords. And I, I think the uh, suggestions that Jimmy was making um, in cabinet uh, about uh, a a dialogue uh, with, uh, with with landlords is a, a really good idea uh, and she um, uh, referenced um, uh, Peterborough as a place where they're doing quite a lot of that and, and Leslie and I were very receptive to that area so I'd like you to uh, to take that on board I don't know if you want to add any more Leslie. Uh, is council claim for into housing associations as well as large landlords? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Are, are, are you referring to the housing associations as well as other large private landlords? Yeah, yeah. We do speak to housing associations and what we are currently trying to do is get a full list of um, contact details for them. So if we get someone coming to us with a problem, we can then go directly to the housing association to go through what the problems are and to try to work with them to resolve the problem. So that is something we are in the process of pulling all together as of now. Brilliant, yeah. We have some and, and contact. This, uh, like Councillor Milne says, that, you know, th this policy could work, you know, in conjunction with that and, and sort of communicating with those bigger landlords as well. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I, I've got quite a few points to make. I'll try and work through them slowly. So, um, um, Councillor Mills and, and, and uh, Richard, you can, can keep up. Um, the, the first point I wanted to make was just to pick up on something that um, Councillor Bradner mentioned. I, I, I do think the document might benefit from a, from a bit of a proofread. Um, I think um, it might have been drafted by different people. So, there are inconsistencies. So, I mean, just to flag up a few. On page 16, it says where the council is, and then on page 17, it starts saying where the council are, um, or should be is, and the bullet point lists are not set out consistently. Sometimes there's a semicolon after each uh, point, sometimes um, there isn't. Um, so I think it would be good if somebody could just go through and, and sort of make it consistent where I think different people have drafted. Sometimes the bullet points start with a capital letter, sometimes they don't. Um, they are fairly political points. Um, on to more um, substantive things. I will work through. I had just I had a question. My first one or my first comment is on page 15. Um, we've got consistency and proportionality, those two paragraphs, um, and openness, or three paragraphs. In the proportionality paragraph, I think actually that's talking about two things. Um, it starts off by saying proportionality means enforcement action will be proportional to the risks and the severity of the offence. That's fine. It then says this will ensure the most serious risks are targeted first. I think actually that's talking about prioritization, not proportionality. So I wonder if that could be separately identified because what follows about is about prioritizing cases, which is not the point about the proportionality of the action um, to the breach. Um, so I think that could maybe be um, looked at and, and perhaps sharpened up um, a little bit. Um, my next sort of major point I would flag up um, is on page 19 where we talk about civil penalties, um, there's a reference to a uh, document. Um, it says Department for Communities and Local Government. Presumably that should have been Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Um, but it talks about Section 3.3 of the document and this section having been written in um, accordance with that. If I've got the right document, because I went and looked at the the guidance from 2018, if I've got the right one, actually there are points in here that are not in Section 3.3, they're actually in section 3.1 and other parts of, of section 3. So I wonder if it's better to just say this comes from section 3 rather than 3.3 because there are actually points um, that are not 3.3, um, at least if I've got the right um, document there. Um, so I thought that may be something that could be uh, looked at. Um, so moving 
on, what have I got, various graphing points that I'll skip over those. Um, on page 24, um, charging for enforcement activity, um, I was just wondering if maybe um, somebody could say something about the um, the reasonableness of this, because the, the Act says, Section 49 says you can make reasonable charges. Um, so I was just wondering if, if somebody could just say a little bit about why they thought these, these charges were were reasonable um, and, and what work had gone into that, um, particularly the 25% or £25 part. I mean, I, I did find some similar policies in other councils, and they seem to set out uh, a much more detailed list of charges. Um, so I was wondering if, if people could just um, say a little bit about that. Um, and then uh, just one other thing on page 24, just because this is a policy document and, and I think it's important that it's clear. Top of page, sorry, page 25. Top of page 25, it says residents can expect a call within two working days. Um, if that's a sort of target or a promise, I think it should probably be in slightly more precise language than can expect. Um, so if we're making a promise and say we aim to call within two working days, I think we should be precise about that because can expect is quite quite imprecise language. Um, I've got the same point really when we come to page 26 and this applies to all of the categories when we talk about medium risk, high risk and urgent risk cases. Um, it, the, the document says the sort of cases that would be de designated as medium risk Irish Sorry, Councillor Williams, I, I, I missed what page reference you were... 26. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor Mills. I know I'm going through a lot of things. Um, 26? Yeah, 26. Thank you. Um, so 26, just at the top, it says the sort of cases that will be designated as medium risk are those where... From, from my reading of it, sort of cases, it wasn't clear whether that was... whether these were fixed criteria, i.e. cases will be designated as medium risk when they meet these criteria, or actually whether there are other criteria, because the sorts of cases doesn't really say whether this is an exhaustive list or these are exhaustive criteria or not. So if they are, if these criteria, these, these sort of hallmarks, if you like, of a, of, of, of a particular case are meant to be, you know, fixed, um, and, and there aren't meant to be others, and I, I think maybe we should sharpen the language there. And it's the same when it says high risk cases and urgent risk, again, it says the sort of cases, and that left me unclear as to whether there were other sorts of cases or other criteria that, that, that were mentioned or whether that was meant to be um, comprehensive. And then my penultimate point, you'll probably be pleased to hear, um, is just when we move then on to page 28. And we're talking about council-owned properties and it talks about Ermine Street. Um, and, and the document seems to imply that actually we wouldn't follow these policies with those uh, with properties owned by Ermine Street, but but we are under a statutory duty to do so because you know they're owned by the companies which are a separate legal personality from the council. So I slightly worry about that, but it's kind of implying that we're not going to follow this policy in relation to those properties when when we are legally obliged to do so because they are owned by a separate entity. They're not owned by the council. Um, so I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. I, I mean, of course, I accept in practice, you know, people will probably maybe talk to people in, you know, who work in Omen Street, which in normal times may be, you know, in the same office. But, um, but I think from a point of view of policy, it's very concerned about us implying that we're not going to, um, you know, apply this policy to those companies because I think we're under a statutory obligation to do so. And then just finally, there's a slightly broader point. Um, but when it comes to setting civil penalties so this is more to do with the document sorry i'll just need to move on it's a bit further on when we talk about um uh, so section two determining civil penalties sort of page 45 we have that document there um appendix B. in the ministry of housing communities and local government um advice was referred to earlier so, sorry, Councillor Williams, you're breaking up on, on us. I, I, I missed yep. that last point. Uh, this is a point about uh, Appendix B and the fixing of civil penalties. In the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government guidance document that we referred to... I'm sorry, can you give me a page reference for that, please? Uh, this is page 39. So it's Appendix B, page 39. Um, it's, not, it's, it's not a specific comment. I'm on a page of that. It's just the, the, the general policy, the whole thing. Um, Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government sort of um, 
paragraph 3.5 of that document that, that was referred to earlier. That, that sets up various criteria that local housing authorities should consider um, in setting an appropriate civil penalty. penalty. So talk about severity of the offence, culpability, harm. Some of these things are in Appendix B, but, but some aren't. So the Ministry of Housing also talks about punishment and deterrence um, and setting penalties um, in a manner that might uh, deter others from committing similar offences. I didn't really get much of that um, from our approach to civil penalties. So I was wondering if um, we might be able to say a little bit more about uh, whether we have taken that into account in setting civil penalties, um, and, and, and if so, how, and if not, why not? Thank you. Sorry, I appreciate that was a very long list of things. Councillor yeah. Milne, would you like to work your way through those, please? Yes, yeah, so if I uh, take the first point, and I'm going to invite Leslie to help me through these uh, separate points. I think uh, some of them are uh, less onerous to deal with than, than others, and maybe uh, we could uh, invite Councillor Williams to uh, join, join us in uh, some of the more uh, complex issues, because I'm, I'm not sure this is a, a forum uh, to... Uh, hand, handle that if if the chair is happy for us to uh, take that away. So uh, there are some layouts and proofreading uh, issues. I think uh, this is a, a slightly earlier version than the latest uh, because I uh, already uh, did some of that proofreading reading, and there are, for example, some formatting issues where there's inconsistency uh, with um, style sheets in the, in the document that we can uh, re um, revise uh, and um, when that gets brought forward uh, to cabinet for approval uh, we can um, do that work um, on page 15 you asked about prioritization uh, versus uh, proportionality seemed, seemed like a reasonable point um, I'd have to reread that a couple of times just to make sure that uh, the, the sense of it wasn't spoiled. Uh, but again, if, uh, if the chair is happy for us to do uh, so, we'll take that offline. Um, this, these questions of section three, I think it's uh, well, well worth revi um, uh, revising that or, or revisiting that to make sure that it's consistent with the legislation uh, referenced. Um, your case on reasonableness. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, we're, we're heading into uh, legalese uh, and, and def definitions of le uh, reasonableness <laughs> are, are a fraught area. Uh, I'm not sure I have any uh, place in uh, trying to uh, ratify that as a term, uh, a suitable term. Uh, I'm not sure about the expectation uh, of two days. I think this is this is to give people a, a, a guide uh, about the sort of response uh, that they should uh, expect from us. But clearly, that's uh, I, I I don't have a problem with the, those words. Uh, so I'm, I'm dubious about whether we really need to do that. And indeed, the sort of cases that you referenced on page 25. Uh, similarly, um, I think it's giving people um, a, a reasonable level of expectation, which is clearly what we want to do in all of this. We want expectation management uh, to uh, uh, over, over, uh, under promise and over deliver is the, uh, is the nature of what we want to do uh, in that, uh, which allows us to. On your uh, point about the cases of uh, council owned uh, properties not being subject, but therefore um, in street um, and elsewhere where uh, they're owned by um, uh, separate entities, but what we're saying is that, <laughs> as you can imagine, we wouldn't expect to get to a situation where we were trying to enforce on our uh, sister companies uh, and their properties. Uh, you would really expect us, again, in terms of expectation management, any such issue to be handled uh, uh, very rapidly with, without our intervention uh, in those cases. Did you wish to follow up, Councillor Williams? Uh, just, just to say, Chair, I'm, I'm happy to, to 
take things offline um, if, if, if that would be easier. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, the only one I'll, I'll just maybe come back on is, is that last point. I mean, I completely accept the practice is like you can do with a restrict, you know, you won't, you won't enforce. But I'm just slightly wary of, of the policy document suggesting we won't do that. I, I wonder maybe again, this is something we could take offline, but um, just maybe changing that word to say, well, you know, we are liable or we are responsible for enforcing against these companies, but we don't expect to be able to do so. Um, it, it, I just thought the wording at the moment left things a bit ambiguous um, and, and could be sort of clear that we do have responsibility there, but of course in practice we, we would expect to resolve it quickly um, in, in other ways. As I said, I, th I think as long as, uh, Chair, you're happy for us to take this offline, I'm happy to work with uh, Councillor Williams uh, and uh, Leslie to, uh, uh, to, to address these issues and just re revisit them and revise if, if we decide that's uh, appropriate. I think that would be very helpful and uh, I look forward to that happening. So please do work together to uh, adjust those minor ones. And while you're at it, you might have a look on page 20 in the second paragraph down. It refers to a finical penalty which I think sure ought to be financial. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chair, we have um, a message, first of all, from Liz Watts to speak directly into your microphone because it's very difficult to hear the other end. And then the order is Councillor Martin Palm, Councillor Peter Fain, Councillor Jeff Harvey, and that's, that's it on my list. And we also have um, Councillor Tina Hawkins, who would like to speak but at the end after the committee members. Thank you very much. Councillor Khan. Well, um, a lot of what I was covered, wanted to say was covered by Councillor Hunt, but um, about, the, uh, uh, about empty property and the problems with things like that. Um, but one thing that does occur to me is that empty property is basically a, a housing department function uh, and uh, a lot of the problems here are basically environmental health functions. And yet actually... Uh, a lot of the problems with uh, empty, prop uh, empty property does produce a lot of uh, environmental health problems. Uh, um, I wanted to know how you managed, how you propose to integrate them. It obviously, there's, a, there's an advantage in integrating the way that you approach it uh, together and interact. How much interaction is there? How much will there be in the future? Thank you. Councillor Bill. Uh, there is a, sorry, there's a second point I wanted to bring, which was, is uh, the comment about uh, which. Um, about interaction with landlords and about, uh, uh, I think that's a good point. Um, I should uh, declare an interest in the sense that I am a landlord myself, but not in this area. Um, in three different areas of the United Kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom, and there are different, quite different approaches in different areas. Uh, but uh, there are areas where there are landlord forums, which uh, 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 which take place, which are useful, the, but they are difficult if the landlord is a long way away. Um, perhaps after the last year's use of uh, distance uh, communication, so <laughs> there may be opportunities to look at uh, for, for using those techniques. Um, and so that's a thought. But another thing that one, uh, uh, this is in Wales, where I've, I have properties, there's, um, there they have a system of uh, awards for landlords or for properties, which they set a higher standard than is necessarily in the air, which you would normally have for environmental health. But, but you then get accredited at a, a higher standard that, uh, of quality that you perhaps would do. Uh, that struck me as quite an ingenious idea uh, about in, for improving the, the standard of property, particularly in an area like here where the, there isn't the same pressures as perhaps there is in South Wales to increase, uh, where, the, where there isn't the same demand to increase the quality of property that you're letting. So that, that's just a thought that might be, uh, might be worth considering. Well, thank you for those observations, and I think the Landlord Forum is, is really part of uh, the consideration that we were talking about earlier in terms of increasing dialogue with the uh, landlord community. Um, I don't know whether uh, Leslie's got anything to say about the integration of uh, you know, managing empty properties and the environmental problems that they uh, um, uh, often accompany those empty properties. I mean, we've, we've had cases recently of uh, increased uh, rat uh, observation. Whether or not there's actually uh, an increase in the population of rats is, an, is another question. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, do you, do you want to uh, say something about that? Because that mostly comes within your team, doesn't it, Leslie? Yes, it does. And I think it's something that will be progressed further as we go, as we go along. 
um, because like you, you rightly pointed out, Councillor Khan, the issues with entry properties does lead on to other environmental health issues where we do get involved and also planning colleagues also get involved in entry properties as well. Um, so there's a number of number of sections within the council and we do need to well we do work join in a joined up manner but we need to improve on that as we go forward thank you very much uh, councillor fay thank you chair i should perhaps preface my comments by declaring an additional interest in that uh, not only do i let a small uh, part of my own house i'm also a director of a small company a uh, property company that uh, has some involvement in uh, short-term lettings and of course in relation to the comments made earlier about page on page 28 about the council-owned housing companies I should declare I'm a director of um, Shire Homes and subject to um, agreement of the the board I've been asked to take on a directorship of um, Ermine Street Housing um, so perhaps I should reflect that in my comments I wanted to focus my comments on three of the areas of legislation listed at Appendix 1 on page 36, but it may well be that some of these comments would have uh, wider application. Um, I'm referring there to the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act, to the management of houses in multiple occupation, and to the energy efficiency uh, regulations. Um, in the Energy Act 2011 and the regulations of 2015. Um, and I'm sort of following on from the comment that it sounds as though it was made by Councillor Tuvi Hawkins at Cabinet about the need for a dialogue with landlords, which I very much support. Um, there are areas, and I think the energy efficiency um, regulations might be one of these, where enforcement is only a small part of wider action which we as a council need to be taking in order to secure wider objectives, in this case an increase in energy efficiency, a reduction in or improvement in affordable housing and so on. Um, where the enforcement action itself will not be limited just to the private limited sector, although there's evidence from other districts that this may be a particular problem in the private limited sector. I see no evidence in relation to this district about that. Um, so where it may be part of a, a wider relationship. And I think in that respect, where we're trying to encourage a dialogue and to also perhaps draw attention to incentives and uh, urgings to improve standards generally, that it may be unhelpful on page 12 to refer to um, rogue landlords. I accept that may be an accurate description, and indeed it was used by the Minister in relation to uh, the paragraph quoted on page 11, but it is nonetheless seen as pejorative, and I think therefore unhelpful, perhaps landlords out of compliance or words to that effect uh, might be um, worth mentioning. Um, I, I mentioned also the uh, management of houses in multiple occupations, I suspect, and again the Minister recognised this in that paragraph on page 11, there may be a lot more work to do in this because it's becoming an increasingly uh, common and popular form of tenure. Um, and one of the differences here is that uh, it may well be that problems caused by the tenants largely cause problems to other tenants rather than to others outside the house. And that is a, a problem of enforcement both for the landlord in that case and also potentially for the council too. Um, in relation to the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act which is quoted here, um, one of the requirements of course is that uh, park home sites in particular must be registered with the council. In some cases I, I know of, one in particular in my own ward, where that uh, declaration, that statement of ownership is long out of date. The company quoted in, um, in, in the notices and so on has ceased to exist and the telephone numbers cease to operate. That could be a problem, for instance, where um, I mean, in relation to the energy efficiency, it's perhaps worth noting that the, the main incentive scheme has recently been wound up and the funds that this council would have derived from that have been, as I understand it, diverted to 
improving energy efficiency standards in park home tenants. Uh, and of course, if we don't know who the, the park home owner is, whether that company is active or not, that may very, make it very difficult to approach the, the tenant in that case. Thank you, that's all I want to say. Councillor Mills, did you so, wish to comment on, on any of that? Uh, Chair, I, I'm, I'm not sure I spotted um, uh, a question uh, in, in amongst uh, Councillor Fain's very useful observations. Um, I think if he's happy, that we'll just take those observations in hand with us. Um, and clearly, this is the first stage um, of a policy uh, development cycle that we will return to. And I think we will uh, clearly take some of those comments into, uh, into account. Thank you very much, Chair. Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps I could just rephrase my comments in relation to road landlords as a question as to whether the uh, whether Councillor Mill might consider a slight rewording in that respect. Uh, well, I think uh, if, if I've understood this uh, properly, the, the reference to the road landlord enforcement guidance for local authorities is the reference to a government document, and so we can't change the, the reference because it is uh, an existing uh, title of a document. So it's not a, it's not a description that we've uh, used. It's a reference to an existing document. Chair, I was referring to the uh, reference on page 12. Um, at the bottom of page 12? Page 12, I was referring to. Yes, at the bottom of tw page 12, it references the document, the Road Landlord Enforcement Guidance for Local Authorities. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeff Hunt. Oh, yes. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered. Um, have we sort of checked uh, in drafting this that, um, I mean, when I read this, I have a sort of picture of, you know, typically somebody who has bought a property in order to perhaps create a, a retirement income, but this could equally be um, a, a limited company, couldn't it? And in fact, um, you might choose as an individual um, to set it up as a limited company for sort of some kind of tax reason. And then that kind of raises the question, well, quite a lot of questions, actually. For example, um, when on page 62 um, in the fourth paragraph, we're, we're talking about increasing the penalty based on the landlord's average income. Well, does that mean specifically the landlord's average income from the rental business he's pursuing? Or does it mean because he might have other sources of income so, so that would need to be specified. And then, of course... It, it would, if I can answer that straight away, that would be the legal entity who's the landlord. So if it's a private limited company who's the landlord, it would be the income coming to that limited company. Okay, thank you. If, so, if, it, was a private, if it was a private individual, it would be uh, that private individual. Okay, thank you. So, so is that income specifically from renting a property or, or is it any income? I think I'll uh, let Leslie reference uh, uh, that question because I'm not quite sure. I will have to double check myself as well. Um, but when we are looking at it, it's to do with what the landlord can afford to pay um, as well. So all income can be taken into account, but I will just uh, make sure that's very clear on the document as to which income we can and can't take into account. Because I was sort of wondering whether this is, um, you know, um, creating a mechanism whereby the landlord could um, sort of effectively plead um, a sort of hardship in, in meeting these penalties or, or whether it's intended to be 
um, a sort of um, multiplier, uh, if you like, to take into account the scale of the business. Um, and I guess I also wondered, you know, about uh, culpability and prosecution. It, it must be slightly different um, if the entity is, is, a, is a company compared with if it's an individual, I, I would have thought, because, um, I mean, are, are, are the directors severally responsible or, or is one of them responsible? Or I, I would thought it could be quite complicated and might need some clarification. Um, and also I wondered about the fairness because um, when you talk about the severity of an offence, um, is that in a sort of qualitative way or could that include a quantitative measure? In, in other words, I'm thinking if you were, um, say, a landlord, probably in this case a limited company, um, and you had, say, 100 properties, um, and you had failed to maintain a smoke alarm in all of them, um, does that mean you're going to be penalised the same as, as um, a single um, property owner? Or will, 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 you be multi will the penalty be multiplied by 100 um, to, to take account so, of the, the, the... So I think you've, you've, you've hit the essence of the um, escalation pro process for the, the fines, which is in that second uh, part of the documents before you. And um, when I was reading through it, um, it was clear that it was a, about creating, so in effect, penalty notice environment rather than a prosecution, a system by which you could evaluate uh, the performance and previous performance of a landlord and whether he, they were a repeat offender or whether they had uh, multiple offences, as you just described, for example, you know, not having a, a, a carbon monoxide uh, detector in every property that they owned, then it, it, it would clearly be a repeat offence. And this uh, mechanism that we've got here is designed to be able to fix a penalty at an appropriate level for a, an overall performance of a, a landlord. Uh, so if, if, for example, the other thing is re repeat, repeatability of uh, offences or, or uh, breaches of, of these, um, uh, uh, these standards, uh, so that if somebody keeps coming back, then we can make an appropriate escalation of, of fines without have, still without having to go through a prosecution method. Um, and, and clearly it's designed uh, to uh, inhibit a landlord from making such repeat offences. It's a published document. If, if a landlord looked at it uh, and saw uh, the, the nature of the escalation, hopefully that itself will become an inhibitor to them continuing uh, breaching these, uh, these protocols. Thank you both very much. It was going to be brief, and it was simply to our right to the late, which I apologise, and would also be to Mr. Blakely as well. I think I arrived after Leslie Reed had given her presentation, and as Councillor Milnes was talking in response to the first question. Um, I, I think in all probability, in all fairness, I have to say no. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins, remotely. Uh, good evening, Chair, and thank you very much for um, allowing me to speak. Good evening, everyone. Um, as uh, Councillor Milnes has uh, uh, referred to, I did participate in the Cabinet discussion on this, and I'm glad to hear that some of the comments I made uh, will be taken on board, uh, which is a good thing. And I must say that, yes, I am a landlord and I deal with potentially five local authorities in the UK, so I have had some experience of um, housing standards and et cetera, et cetera. One thing I will say is this, and I know I say this each time this comes up, is I'm not used to seeing issues on housing um, on the environmental health, even if it's uh, to do with enforcement. But we're where we are. Um, 
I take the point that Council of Fame was making about the terminology of rogue landlord. And if I might point out to you, Councillor um, Mills, page 12, first bullet point, and the third bullet point both have rogue landlords in it. It wasn't just the, um, the document itself. Um, that's by the by. And those who know me um, know that I do not actually subscribe to the term rogue landlords. It It is to private landlords, it, um, it doesn't come across well. <laughs> Uh, at all, and I think you will appreciate that. Um, Councillor Bradnam asked the question about protection from bad tenants. Um, there is a way to do that, and I think that is part of the communications issue um, that I have referred to in the past, because there are tenants who work the system, <laughs> know how to work the system, which means local authorities need to work with landlords to make sure that um, you know the landlords do have some protection. I know a number of times you say, well, the landlords have recourse to the courts, et cetera, et cetera. But then when they do go to court and it results in homelessness, they are blamed for causing homelessness. So really it's down to us as a local authority to try and work, you know, with both landlords and tenants to ensure that you know people can stay in their homes, that the homes are kept to a good standard. But that is, you know, um, my view of what we need to be doing. And um, the paper is a good one, so thank you for the work that's gone into it. I just think you know there's a lot of stick, and it needs to be balanced with carrots. And it goes back again to ensuring that we talk to our landlords. I know we have done in the past actually um there was a landlord forum but it didn't last very long i don't know why but it's easy enough to set up and there are good examples and i said i said peter Bra is a good one to follow um and i'm sure you will have uh, have a look at that i just want to make sure that we are aware that um there could be malicious vexatious complaints um that potentially is not you know, catered for <laughs> in this document. All right, so it's not all one sided. On page 26, you mentioned potentially uh, having standard templates that tenants can use to uh, write to their landlords. However, that particular paragraph is a bit, uh, it's not clear. So, in the way, it says the tenants will be offered advice on how to write to their landlord detailing their complaint. A standard letters template may be provided. It's not a complete sentence. Um, you might want to re you might want to rework that um, and make it you know make it clear that there, there's um, there's uh, you know what it is you can offer. Um, note of that. Thank you. I have a question, which is to do with the fact which to do with the experience of those who will be enforcing this. Because obviously there's housing standards involved, especially with the HMO licensing. Um, there's all kinds of standards, there's space standards, amenity standards, fire safety standards, heating standards, and all that. Um, as well as the, um, the scoring of the um, housing health and safety rating system. Now, that in itself <laughs> is a specialty. And I just wondered if we have that specialty in-house or if we're going to have to do some training or get somebody in or whatever it is, because this is what determines whether or not a good landlord ends up being branded a bad landlord because <laughs> the assessment has not been done in a fair way. But that's that's something for you to uh, to have a think about. I don't know if we have that experience or not and if we're going to get it in. Um, Councillor Hawkins, are we, are we coming to a conclusion? Yes, I am, sir. And last but not least is that I would hope that we would have all this information on our website somewhere where everyone can go and have a look at it. So that is that was my last point, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Chair, um, the CEO would like to comment, to clarify on the recommendations before we vote. Uh, Liz Watts, would you 
Right to come in, Council, please. Council Chamberlain, thank you very much. And it's just a clarification. The recommendation, uh, it's recommended that the policies are approved. Obviously, scrutiny can't approve these policies. So actually, could we just change the recommendation to say it's recommended that the policies are recommended onto Cabinet? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and I think following the discussions that we've had, there clearly is uh, some more work to be done. And I note that Councillor Williams is going to work with uh, Councillor Milnes uh, to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's and clarify one or two points. And I think subject to that, uh, I'm inclined to invite Cabinet to take note of report and the report and we therefore recommend that it should go forward to Cabinet. Do we need to say um, we recommend that the policies are recommended to Cabinet subject to amendment? Yes, absolutely. Uh, is anyone against that recommendation? No, we are we are unanimous. Oh, indeed. So, yeah, uh, Councillor Bradman was uh, late arriving, but unable to vote. Uh, but apart from Councillor Bradman. Uh, various members preface their comments by saying they had an interest in uh, residential property taxation. I've done the same as I'm the director of a company which has a modest interest in residential property, but it doesn't in any way affect my comments. So, yeah. Thank you very much. That that will, of course, be noted. Uh, but I take it, I, I, I presume that everyone else is in favour, that we recommend this to go forward to Cabinet subject to the comments that we've made and the additional work to be done. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Mills, and thank you, Leslie. Yes, thank you for uh, the comments and the consideration of the uh, committee. So we move on to item seven, which is the quarter four performance report. And I'd like to introduce Councillor Neil Gough to present his report. Councillor Gough. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you said, this is the quarter four uh, report which covers both the KPIs and um, the uh, reporting against the business plan objectives. Uh, I guess experience has told me the best way of handling this is just to uh, put it to uh, scrutiny to uh, respond to questions. Um, so I'll happily hand back to you and your committee. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. And I see Councillor van der Weyer's hand is up. So welcome. <coughs> Thank you very much. Your yeah. first question um, to yeah. scrutiny. Yeah, very, very pleased to, to be back on scrutiny. It's a little wild. Um, yeah, so uh, um, there's some really obviously good stuff in the in the um, uh, in the report. Um, and I would, though, however, like to um, uh, focus on one of the particularly uh, uh, less encouraging things, which is around the stats on the call centre, um, contact centre. Uh, to the percentage of calls uh, that were answered um, has declined considerably in the last quarter um, and the, um, the call answer time has gone up hugely uh, I mean doubled uh, more than doubled um, uh, in between February and March for example um, uh, which, is a, which is a problem I mean I think it's worth um, uh, saying that the, obviously call the calls contacts through the call center generally uh, um, are uh, sort of less and less important as a as a element of of the interactions between the council um, and, and our residents. Um, although I, I'm, I'm sure um, it'd be interesting to know the, sort of the, the volumes that were that, that that will have gone up um, during, over the, during the pandemic. So um, that, that 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 pressure does have to be to be reconciled, uh, recognised. Um, uh, I, I think rather than just sort of asking, uh, I mean the, the, the commentary is useful. Uh, rather than just sort of focusing on on the on the problem itself. Um, possibly asking about about how we can uh, um, uh, sort of look at this more broadly in a broader context. I mean, obviously there is this effort to get more and more um, uh, of, of the interactions done online. Um, uh, so I'd be interested to know sort of how that's going and what more we can do with that, and, and, and whether we can sort of be thinking about um, other ways of, of, of enhancing that and encouraging that. Um, and and um, yeah, as I mentioned about some more staff and a new system and. Um, uh, are, are there any any things we could think of to to, to uh, just 
other ways of helping manage that the volumes of calls and, and the, the problems with uh, calls being unanswered or being um, taking a lot of time to, to be answered, um, uh, such as call me back options, for example, um, other ways of, of, of doing that because obviously it's, uh, um, yeah, the, uh, I mean, I would ho hopefully, as, as things ease up a bit, uh, the, the contact center will, the calls to the contact center will become uh, uh, less important and, and we need to sort of do what we can to, to encourage as that in, uh, um, uh, residents to use alternative means as much as possible. Councillor Goff. Yeah, okay. So um, thank you, Councillor Van der Vaar, for this, this question. This is obviously the, the kind of standout um, KPI which we need to talk about. So, Chair, if you'll excuse me, I am going to take a little time um, to talk through this. And um, as Councillor Van der Waal said, sort of think about what uh, what some of the issues which we need to work on are. And um, I will at the end ask um, uh, Jeff Membery to, to, to come in and um, uh, pick up on some of the some of the things. Um, I, I it, you know, the, the first point is that to, to make is that it is disappointing that that residents have to wait so long for um, getting service on the call centre because because some residents and I put the emphasis on the some residents uh, actually do need to call to address a particular a particular problem or a particular issue and I asked um, uh, Kevin Ledger to, to produce a, a chart for me which I I will make sure that you see in scrutiny um, but I hesitate to share my screen because I know I will fail um, but the but the gist of it is that what I asked him to do was plot um, calls per day received into the call center versus waiting time and what one sees is, is that is a sort of exponential relationship exactly as you would expect so in essence, if the calls are 600 calls per day or less, the call center copes and the waiting times are minimal or certainly less than less than target. When the calls go above 800 calls a day, the call center can't cope. And what happens is that it can't deal with the inbound calls fast enough, so the calls stack up and therefore the waiting times increase exponentially. Um, so this is, this is a problem really of variability of demand. And of course the problem is that the people who need to call um, get stuck in the same queue as the people who don't need to call, who could perhaps access the services in the other way. So um, part of the resolution of this is to make sure we've got enough staff and obviously if we've got staff shortages that doesn't help but that isn't the that isn't the solution to the problem longer term because if we staff up to deal with a thousand calls per day that's obviously inefficient um, because when there's only 400 calls a day uh, there's going to be um, uh, basically, you know, a surplus of requirement. So this isn't a problem which um, we, we, we are the only organisation uh, to, uh, to to deal with, um, but it is it is a problem which which we are faced with because we don't, and many of the members I think will probably have experienced this in the pandemic. We don't have the option of what many organisations have done during the pandemic, which is to switch off their call centre, you know. So uh, for those of you who, who are members of the RAC and if you break down and you're not on a motorway now, uh, you have to report online. There is no call centre for you. So we don't have that, we don't have that option. So we need to do other, other things. I would just draw members' attention to page 101 uh, which is to flip into the business plan part of the 
um, thing. And you will see there part of the work which is being done to address this problem holistically um, rather than just through the call centers. So um, D4 um, calls actually in 2021 were reduced 16% uh, from um, the previous year. So actually the way in which we're doing that is the other objective on D4 above, which is to get people uh, using more online transactions and 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 actually carrying out their services without actually having to call. So, so those are some of the the, the, the broader initiatives we're taking. Council Vandewa asked about a pullback, um, so that when people are in a queue, uh, they don't have to wait; they could ask for a service uh, whereby the calls are returned. Um, we've asked Mr. Membry to take a look at that. And we've also asked him to look at other means like chat services as well. But I, I can, if, Chair, if you will allow me just to pass over to Mr. Membry to talk about the new telephony service and to what extent that can help us deal with some of those problems. Thank you very much. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, yes, exactly. As, as Councillor Goff said, we had a real challenge in March in so much as we had very high volumes of calls. We had comfortably over a thousand on several occasions. I think we reached a high of 1,400 calls in a single day, which is a, a great many calls. Uh, and not only did we have high volumes, but the nature of the calls were different from previous years. People, we had a lot of calls from businesses and people seeking supports due to COVID. So it, the, the length of time to deal with calls went up quite considerably as well. And this, of, of course, as these things always do happen at a time when we've lost some staff from the contact centre and we're in the process of, of re-recruiting. I'm, I'm pleased to, to tell um, members that we successfully appointed five new members of staff. They started on the 1st of June and they're in the process of being trained. And that brings us back up to the correct level and number of staff in, in the call centre. Um, uh, as Councillor Goff has, has referred to, though, uh, we're in the process of modernising our call centre as well. The technology that we've been using was was uh, fantastic when we, we, we took it on sort of 10 years ago, but it is somewhat out of date now. And we've just gone through the process of evaluating the tenders for a, a new call centre telephony system. And uh, we're, we're likely to announce the results of that uh, next week. Um, as part of that tender specification, we've built in a great deal of, 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 of the requirements you might expect that allowed us to uh, undertake things such as the callback arrangements that, that Councillor Goff has uh, mentioned. And we're looking at what the resource requirements are to deliver on that to ensure that that's one of the, the things that we can put forward for our, our customers. But also at the same time, we're looking at the fact that there will always, no matter what we do, there will always be times when the call centre is busy. Um, people lead their lives slightly differently now and might not have time to wait like they have in, in the past. So we're looking at what other options we can make available to our residents. Um, one of those are a web chat so that if people don't have the time to wait, they can go on to our, um, our, our uh, website and engage in a web chat with, with uh, one of our customer services officers. Um, what's been shown is that actually in the, in the time it takes a customer services officer to deal with one complex telephone call, they can deal with three complex web chats. So effectively that, that increases the, our capacity to deal with the inquiries. Now there'll always be people that need to phone us, not everybody is digitally enabled, but what we're looking to do is to allow those people that live their lives uh, it, digitally, like they, like most people do with with every other part of their lives, you know, when it comes to contacting other organisations, whether that be retail organisations or arranging your insurance or paying your water rates, all of that is done now on online primarily. So to allow those people that live their lives in that way to be able to contact us in that same way and to extend our capacity to deal with those inquiries outside of normal office hours. One of the things that we, we have at the moment is we're, we're limited to uh, normal office hours where we can provide customer services officers to uh, give assistance to residents. 
but we're starting to look at artificial intelligence, which is now being increasingly used for transactional services and local authorities. And one of the benefits of that, it means that when somebody's got a relatively straightforward inquiry, they can phone us at any time, day or night, and get a response to their inquiry, either, either on the phone or, or via a, a web chat. Being open and honest with them that it's a, 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 a um, a bot that's answering their inquiry and giving them the option to call back if they need to. But in the vast majority of cases, that, that isn't required. Um, a really good example of, of that is um, the Airways KLM. Most, the vast majority, 80% of their, their inquiries on their website and their telephones are actually dealt with by bots now because they're relatively straightforward transaction inquiries. So we're looking at a whole range of options that not only reduces the likelihood that we're not going to meet our targets in the call centre, but actually extends the customer's um, service opening times for our residents to, so that we're available at times that suit them. Um, it's going to take a, a number of months, potentially up to a year, to get a lot of these things in place. I think it's quite an exciting development and certainly one that I'm looking forward to championing. Um, uh, it's, I'm happy to field any questions that people might have. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, Councillor Van der Wey would like to come back, I think. Yeah, just, just very briefly, um, thank you very much for, for both of your, your explanations. I, I think you've sort of been quite sort of straight with us by the sound of it um, and um, tells us a lot about what you're doing um, to address the problem. Uh, I mean, I mean the, 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 the stats will be in, in quarterly reports anyway, so we'll be discussing it again further, but um, I, I do look forward to, to um, I, 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 if, um, I'll just check. So in, in, three, in, in the next quarter, these stats will be here again, so you'll be, be looking at it again. Um, if you're talking about it sort of coming back, in, um, taking a little bit longer than that to, to really see the, see the results, then, then maybe we need to be more focusing on sort of six months' time rather than sort of three months' time. It's a little, not, not, uh, not, not sort of put too much pressure on you to, to change it completely in, uh, in three months' time. Thank you very much. The next question is from Councillor Ripple. Thank you. Um, on page 79, with the tenants satisfied with responsive repairs um, data there, I know it's in the red, but I just really want to comment that I'm actually pleased to see this because I think it looks like a much more truthful and honest picture of the actual situation from the point of view of being a local member. Um, previously, it seemed a bit miraculous that there were never any sort of negative responses whereas the um i was just going to really say that the way in which um the is being sent to change from the survey questions are sent by text messages so the tenant is not put under pressure on the doorstep to say what a wonderful job that's been done and i'm just really asking if that's going to continue and obviously how long do you think it's going to take um, before that comes out of the red and goes into the amber and green. I know with the um, um, possible change of the contract coming up, so what's your time frame? But it's actually quite pleasing to see. Councillor Goff. I, I can, I, I, would you mind, Chair, if I pass that over to Councillor Batchelor? No, it's absolutely fine. Councillor Batchelor. Right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Evening and evening to members. This is my first appearance before you, so uh, I've been looking forward to that. So thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, of course, you're entirely right. and We, we um, have been aware for some time that uh, the um, satisfaction results are, uh, to, to say the least, questionable. Um, the current situation, it, it, don't forget that you can see there's only December and March there. So um, this is not really very representative because in January and February, uh, there was no responsive uh, repairs taking place. MIRs were only, only doing uh, emergency work. So um, I expect the, the uh, um, response to be better next time. But I think, as you, as you said, Councillor Ripith, um, you know, uh, 
a six foot um, um, plumber standing on your doorstep asking if it had been okay um, is, to say the least, probably a little intimidating. So we are looking at other ways of doing this, uh, and they they will be put in place in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Councillor Cohn. Councillor Cohn. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on uh, Councillor Aidan uh, van der Waal's uh, question, which I, I, I totally agree with um, the, the points that he made. Um, in the in the response, Councillor the Goth talked about the fact that the council needs to do more to transfer some of those transactions online, and it's clear from page 101 that that has happened. In, you know, in fact, 16% more, um, and thus resulting in less calls. Um, but that, for me, makes the um, figures actually even worse because. We, we have demonstrated that we can start to move those um, people to you know, other means of getting through to the council. But actually, the people that are now not doing that might be you know, actually the, the more vulnerable proportion of the people ringing into the council and those that haven't got the means to do it in any other way. Um, and and it, you know, it just makes you know, quite bad figures look even worse um, when actually we're... We, dealing with fewer calls, more people using the online services, and still we're making very vulnerable residents wait a very long time for those calls to be answered, you know, if they're not hanging up in the meantime. So I, I wondered if he would just comment on that. And my other point was on page 85 um, re regarding um, complaints. Um, the breakdown of those figures um, in uh, uh, where where those complaints are not being dealt with adequately are clearly coming from the uh, Greater Cambridge uh, Planning Service. You know, very very poor figures there. Twenty one point four percent. Three out of fourteen is really quite shocking figures of complaints that are not being dealt with, and. Um, you know, if someone has the need to complain and then the council is essentially ignoring that based on these figures, that, that is pretty shocking, I, I think. Um, could, could you, could you ask, uh, answer whether those figures are across both councils? I assume it's the shared planning service, so those figures are amalgamated from both councils, or, or is it just from... South Cams. Thanks very much. Councillor Goth. Okay, thank you for your for your question, Councillor Cohen. So, so in in terms of the call centre, you know, the, the the issue is we don't really know. What, what I, I think it's fair to say which calls are coming from, which are essential calls and which are, you know, calls which should be dealt or could be dealt with in other ways. So, um, it's it's not possible, given the the information we have available to. To determine that in, in terms of the relationship of the number of calls if you remember i said that essentially the call center can deal with on average about 600 calls a day and stay pretty much on target if you look at the number of calls we've got in 2020 2021 which is 142,000, if you spread that over say 220 working days a year that's about 650 calls a day on average. So we can deal um, on an average day reasonably reasonably well, um, and the below our average day obviously very well. So it is, it is about managing this sort of variability, and in particular, managing the sort of peaks of, peaks of demand and trying to um, sort of move that demand onto other channels, hence, uh, why we asked um, Mr. Membry to look at look at callback services, for example, and web chat, which are more effective ways of dealing with those peaks. Um, in terms of the the uh, information on the 
complaints, you're right. Um, you know, planning, planning is the area where those are those issues are there. You will see in the notes that there's been um, a particular focus on resolving the backlog of those planning complaints with a expectation that from quarter one onwards, those will be uh, significantly reduced. But I think, can I again ask sort of Mr. Membry, um, Chair, to, uh, to pick up on that? Because I know he's looked at the actual complaint processes across the various departments. Chair, please go on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, planning are in the uh, invidious position of being incredibly busy and therefore getting uh, a lot of complaints. So the challenge for them was always working out how to allocate their priority between deciding planning applications and dealing with complaints. Um, I spent some time with them recently looking at how we can revamp that, that the way that they deal with complaints. And what came to light is that currently, well, what was happening was, was the complaints were going to planning um, uh, planners to, to resolve. Whereas actually a lot of the complaints weren't about technical planning issues. They were on, they were asking, you know, what was happening with with an application or, or why uh, applications had to be made in a particular way or why something wasn't sh showing on the website. So we've made some changes so that actually we, we've already seen that for um, application, sorry, for complaints that have been made uh, in the first quarter of this year, a, a far higher percentage of those uh, complaints are being resolved um, uh, within the, the time scales, and only those that are really on very technical issues are going to, to our hard press planners. So it, so it will take a little bit of time for it to come through the system because there, there was a backlog of complaints within planning which we've had to clear. But so we've, we've halved the backlog of, of the complaints in planning, and as I say, for, for new complaints that come in, a, a, a high percentage of those are now being cleared within time. Uh, but it'll take us a, a, a little bit of time to work our way through all of the backlog. Um, Councillor Richard Williams. Councillor Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I just want to start by um, saying I, I, I agree with the comments Councillor Rufus made. I think text is a better um, way of, of getting feedback on housing and property services. Um, j just on that point about housing and property um, and, and the, the decline in satisfaction, I um, just wanted to ask a factual question as to whether that would include the roofing repairs that were going on in, in, in various parts of the district, certainly in my part of the district in the early part of the year. And I know there were some problems there. Um, so I, I wonder if it does include those roofing repairs, whether maybe that had been looked into. It wasn't carried out by mayors, it was, it was somebody else. Um, but, um, but I'd be interested to know whether that, 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 that's accounted for in, in, in that part. Um, and then I had just another point, which is on planning um, and the performance indicators. Um, percentage of non-major applications determined within, within eight weeks or agreed time lines. Can we have an indication of the number of applications where there was an extension agreed um, within those um, performance indicators? I think I think we are expecting another audit report um, at some point um, for 2021, I believe. But but it would be useful if we could be given um, an indication of how many of those applications that uh, have apparently met the, the um, uh, target were actually extensions. Thank you, Councillor Goff. Were you able to? Clarify that. Um, in terms of the question on the roofing repairs, I don't know whether Councillor Bachelor or uh, Mr. Campbell will be able to Mr. Ask. Campbell Peter. answer. Peter. Right, my understanding that the um, uh, figure shown is for the main repairs contractor. The, the roofing was the capital work that would have been recorded separately. Thank you. Councillor Goff, are you going to take the second part? Uh, yeah, I think the best way to do that is we'll take that away, I think, uh, and see where, whether we can add any more information to uh, address the um, issues you raised, uh, Councillor Williams. I think gen generally, I, I, you know, one of the things I think which would be quite helpful, and I don't want to overpromise this, but <laughs> in terms of uh, improving the understanding of some of this data, like, for example, the call centres. I'm just thinking we might actually add the number of number of calls received, for example, on these on these charts, just to add a little bit more context. Um, likewise, the number of planning applications received and so forth might add, add some actual sort of clarity to some of this data and make it easier to pick, 
for scrutiny and cabinet to pick, build a picture of what's actually going on. I think that's a very good suggestion. I think it was very helpful. Thank you. Do we have any other? Any we other? have two final speakers, Councillor Khan, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Martin Khan. <coughs> There's a couple of things that I wanted to ask about. Uh, firstly, I was going to comment about the uh, comment about using bots for responding to questions, and my immediate reaction was, "Don't let me, don't let me ever book on KLM." Um, my reaction when I achieve a bot is extremely negative. Um, so you may meet the requirements in terms of time, but actually produce a bad response. And I think you must bear that in mind that many people really don't like bots. Um, Secondly, the comment that I, would make, I was going to ask about is the uh, pension fund uh, forms, which have now been uh, started again. Um, I was very glad to have my pension form signed about shortly afterwards. I just, there, there must have been a large backlog uh, of people who, in fact, many of them may not have been receiving pensions because uh, the EU pensions because of it. I just wondered how that had proceeded, if you, got, if you could report back on that. It's not separately recorded, but I thought it would be interesting to know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I hear um, Councillor Khan's uh, uh, comments about bots. All I can say is that sometimes a good bot is better than a poor call, call centre service operator. Um, you know, I, I happened to lose a, a, a credit card uh, and reported that credit card. I, I, I think I was dealing with a bot. In fact, I know I was dealing with a bot, but, but actually the service was, was really good. I think it, it, again, all comes back to the quality of, of what service is provided. If, it, if the quality is there, um, it's, it, it provides a consistency of service, which is what we're aspiring to. Um, and it can be uh, as, as good as a, as a call centre operator if it is correctly set up and uh, um, correctly managed. Um, in, in terms of the pension Forms. I know a couple of, um, you know, have had an experience of that where, where people have to go in and get those signed. I, I don't know whether, um, Chief Executive, we, we, we have had that service, haven't we, sort of put in place, and even during COVID times, but or, Mr. Member, maybe where we are or stand on that. Sure. Uh, uh, yes, I'm happy to tell members that we, we opened uh, to the public again today uh, for pension verification. So that's that's been going on at South Council today. I, I just wondered what procedures have been put in place to remind people who have been doing it in the past. In fact, it started, I think, early early, early June, so you could book it online then. Um, and the uh, one of the procedures have been put in place to remind people who have the forms, who may not know that they now can have them um, signed, to, 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 to their awareness the fact that now it's the services operating again. Uh, yeah, yes, Councillor. Well, well, people have contacted us to request that one. That service wasn't available. We, we took their uh, contact details and we've been contacting them and letting them know that it's now available. And in fact, you know, we, we were pretty much fully booked uh, today and, and we, we are for the next sort of week or so uh, catching up with those people that have been waiting to have their, uh, their pension verified. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Councillor Daunton. Thank you, Chair. My question is about the um, the B and B costs, um, page seventy nine. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that we're working very closely with the city, and uh, do these figures reflect our close working with the city? Chancellor Gott, did you wish to respond to that, or is uh, Chair, if you wouldn't mind, I ask Councillor Bachelor again to take that one. By all means, Councillor Bachelor. Right, thanks very much. Um, these, these figures, I mean, we do work closely with the, the city all the time, but uh, these particular costs are South Cam's costs. Um, I, I, I have some figures here that um, may actually um, give some confidence uh, to members that this isn't an area that's out of control. At the end of the year, there was £259,000 expenditure, but uh, a lot of this was down to uh, the COVID situation. 
and we have actually received from government some substantial um, grant funding for that element and we have also had to um, increase our services for rough sleepers and again there's been a grant for that uh, most of uh, the clients in, in this area um, are entitled to benefits, which also comes to us. The upshot of all that is that um, funding coming into us amounted to £231,000. So the actual cost for the year for the bed and breakfast actually to South Cairns District Council was 27821 so I think that's pretty well in target. Hope that helps. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I have no more speakers, no more questions on this point. Uh, we are asked to review the KPI results and comment upon them, which we have done, and to recommend where appropriate any actions required to address issues identified for consideration by Cabinet. But I think the suggestions have come from Councillor Gough and from Jeff Membry. So uh, with those in mind, are members willing to approve and take note of the KPI report, the fourth Agreed. quarter report? Thank you all very much indeed. So now we move on to the work programme, which is set out on pages 103 to 112 of your agenda pack. I'd ask you really to take note of this, uh, but what I can say is that we will have, be having a meeting in July. It will be on the 20th of July, not the 27th, as noted in your paper. And the main item for consideration will be the recovery plan, which will cover uh, the proposed recovery right across the uh, right across the council so I anticipate it will be a very comprehensive paper and uh, we may have a lengthy meeting as a result in terms of the other items on the work program the uh, vice chair and I will be talking to um, the cabinet uh, talking to the leader in a triangulation meeting and we will be planning um, some additional items I'm sure to come forward as well. Other than that, I think unless there are any questions on the work programme, I'm happy to confirm that the next two scheduled meetings will be on Tuesday the 20th of July and Tuesday the 14th of September. Both will commence at 5.20pm. And oh, we will... Chair, Councillor Williams. Ah, sorry. Yes, please. Councillor Williams. Jay, it was just a quick one. I've already mentioned it, but is there any update on when we are likely to get that second audit for the planning that we were promised in the last meeting? I can't answer that at this stage. Councillor Goff, were you able to indicate the time frame for the second audit of the uh, planning service? I'm afraid I'm not. I don't know whether the chief executive could... No, I, I see shaking heads. I think we may have to come back to you on that point. So the second meeting will be on Tuesday the 14th of September, both of them commencing at 5.20, with a pre-meet the previous day commencing at 4 o'clock. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that that concludes our meeting for this evening. Uh, can I thank you all for your attendance? It is... It's been marvellous to see so many of you in person, although the fact that I feel behind a little imprisoned behind this, behind this screen. Uh, can I thank all our colleagues who have uh, contributed remotely? Aaron, thank you very much for organising the IT, which has worked incredibly well. Uh, and I wish you all, and I mean it this time, have a very safe journey home. Thank you and good night.